welcome to our lesson this morning in our series, the last of the sermon in the series on the Psalms, Songs of God's People. And today I want to talk about, as we finish our study, just looking how we can take all that we've learned and uh, compile it and study a psalm. And so I've chosen as as the psalm that we're going to do this to, or do this, is Psalm 103. And I've titled the lesson this morning, um, The Song of Steadfast Love. Just think of all that we've learned in all these lessons in this series, as we bring this series to a close. What are some things that we've learned together? We've learned that the Psalms are more than just a book in the Bible. They're, they're compiled with, uh, and, and put together at specific, very specifically. Um, there's a purpose to its order. There's a reason why there are Psalms in Book 1, and Psalms in Book 2, and Book 3, and Book 4, and Book 5. We've learned that the Psalms, we can come to the Psalms individually, and they can be a prayer. A prayer for... Uh, any circumstance in our life. You know, if you've ever had, uh, I, I can think of myself when, when I've had a very difficult time and I struggle to find the words to pray to God. I'll share with you uh, uh, and be quite frank, I didn't know what to pray. I couldn't find the words and I didn't think to go to the, the Psalms. And so as I've gotten older and as I've come to the scripture more and more, I've seen the Psalms with, that contain words that I can pray. They fit with just about anything I could, any circumstance I could come up with. We saw that, the, that they can be read. We can come to the Psalms and we can read Jesus as the Messiah, where we read God's anointed. We can see Jesus. When... when and it's just this awesome way. And we learned that, that some of the Psalms are prophetic Psalms concerning Messiah. We saw in a video a couple of weeks ago that some of the Psalms are uncomfortable. They contain hatred towards a person. They contain vid vindictiveness, calling out for revenge and retribution. And that God would bring his judgment upon a nation bring calamity upon them. And we, we struggle with that. That makes them uncomfortable because in the context of the rest of the Scripture and, and in the New Testament, how can we pray a prayer like that and, and love our neighbor as ourselves? And I wonder, and remember I shared with you that I wonder if they're there. Not that we're praying to God, though we could, but praying to God as a way of here's, how I feel God. But I recognize you are a loving and just God. And, and all I ask, is that a possibility? You know, we struggle. And I think it's okay to live in attention there. We saw uh, that Psalms are grouped together by theme or they contain a phrase. We saw Psalm 146 through 150 contain the phrase, praise the Lord. And that, and, and we feel, we saw that perhaps that's why they're grouped there. And there are the Psalms that end the whole, they end book five, but they also serve as the conclusion, especially Psalm 150 is the conclusion of the book of Psalms in the Bible. We saw last week that psalms can be sung in worship and in our daily life. That We saw the New Testament passages that were telling us that as we go through life, if we're in worship or we're traveling to work or wherever, as we go through life, sing a psalm. Today I want to look at just a single psalm, Psalm 103 and develop a way we can study the Psalms as we look at everything around it, and then go into it. And so, as I said, as I opened this morning, the Psalm today is Psalm 103, and I call it the Psalm, the Song of Steadfast Love. 
Uh, you'll notice I'm using a different translation if you're following along in your New American Standard 2020. Because of the phrase, <coughs> excuse me, because of the phrase steadfast love, the English Standard Version actually has that phrase. So I'll be using the English Standard Version this morning. Your version may say, uh, the mercy of the Lord. Uh, they both mean the same and come from the same word in Hebrew. So let's open and let's read together Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. I'll read the title as well. Bless the Lord, O my soul, of David. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Whoever forgives all our iniquity, who heals all our diseases, who redeems our life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who testifies you, excuse me, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Are you ready for the message God has for us today? Cool. Let's dig in. You know, a preacher once, I heard a preacher once say, a text out of context is a pretext. And that sounds kind of funny, uh, but it's true. A text out of context is a pretext. Uh, in my studies, this has been so important to me. From early on, I have been told, and even today as I come to Scripture, context, context, context. Establishing the context of any passage of Scripture is a prerequisite to understanding what it teaches. And in our time the last couple of years, I hope you've seen that as I've tried from time to time to bring in the history, to, to tell you what's going on at the time it was written, what's going on around the passage to establish its context. And this is true for Psalm 103 as well. So let's look at establishing the context of Psalm 103. With any passage of the Bible, take it out of context, you can justify almost anything. And it's such a shame to see that as it even happens in the church today, as people take scripture, take a, a passage out of context and misuse it to justify something. Well, working on the context in the Psalms, well, that can be seen as a difficult task. Prior to the 19th century, commentators read the Psalms as religious poems of the devout in ancient Israel. They didn't really consider any kind of historical context or, or anything like that. They just read them as beautiful poems of ancient Israel. Well, scholarship in the 20th century introduced a fundamental shift in contextualizing the Psalms. And contextualizing is a fancy word for putting it in, in its context. Uh, they, come, they came to be seen as essentially composed for worship in the temple. So we're getting closer that, that it's, they're not just religious poems, right? We saw that they are prayers and songs that they used in worship in the temple and in their synagogues at specific festivals and feasts in ancient Israel. And John Eaton is one of these uh, commentators. He, in his book, The Psalms, an uplifting commentary about the Psalms, followed this line of thinking. And, then, and let me remind you, the thinking is that the Psalms were essentially composed for worship in the temple. He saw, for example, our Psalm, Psalm 103, as written for the Autumn Festival of Tabernacles. Now, there's nothing there in the title, but he got that from some of what it talks about. Uh, he felt like it would be a perfect psalm or poem or song that could be done and read or sung at the, the, the Feast of Tabernacles. So this would be the psalm's primary purpose then in ancient Israel. Now, at the end of the 20th century, another shift took place. Each psalm should be read in the context of the whole collection. So the, the, the context widens. Used in worship, 
But why is Psalm why is it Psalm 103? Why is it located where it's located in book four? What's going on in the Psalms of Book Four? What is its place in the collection of the Psalms as a whole? Consider its place then in the whole book, right? But then also in its place in the five books, and then then further canonizing it or putting it in the canon in the Bible. Why is Psalm 103 located here in the Bible? What is its place in the story of God that unfolds in Scripture? This canon, canonical approach has been the most innovative and least speculative of all critical readings of the Psalms. Again, speculative. Speculation that the Psalm 103 would be used at the tabernacles. There's nothing in it that specifies its use there. That was something that John Eaton and maybe some of his peers thought it was a good place to use it. So let's, let's, let's do that. Let's go through this practice. So let's put Psalm 103 in book 4 in the book of Psalms. So let's consider Psalm 103 and the Psalms that follow it. So beginning with Psalm 104. As a whole book, the Psalms are considered, right, a book of the Bible. And then there are links between the individual Psalms, so it would seem natural then to read the Psalms in sequence. Then we have the titles that, that are seen further to help establish what's going on with the psalmist and in the psalm itself. So, bless the Lord, O my soul, a psalm of David. David is wanting to bless the Lord. So what's the place of Psalm 103 then? Well, Psalm 103 begins and ends with the exhortation, Bless the Lord, O my soul. The first line, right? Verse 1, first line, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Verse 22, last phrase of the psalm, Bless the Lord, O my soul. This expression links Psalm 103 with Psalm 104. What's the first line of that psalm? Bless the Lord, O my soul. And Psalm 104 ends, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and adds, Praise the Lord. It's a kind of paraphrase of Genesis 1. Psalm 104 is seen as kind of a paraphrase as it talks about creation and, and what what God has created, and it's seen as a paraphrase of Genesis 1. And then you come to Psalm 105. It recounts the story of Israel from the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to the exodus out of Egypt. So it recounts a specific history that kind of begins with the book of Exodus and goes through to Deuteronomy. 106 recounts Israel's sin while in the wilderness. Well, that, a lot of that happens in, in numbers. Thus, these psalms are tied then to the Torah, to the Pentateuch, to the Law of Moses. Well, what are those words implying? The five books that open the Bible. Genesis. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. What we're learning is that Psalm 103 then serves as a prelude to the summary of the Torah, to the summary of the first five books of the Bible. By the way, Torah is the Hebrew word for law. So, the law of Moses, the Torah of Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament. Get this. So just think about that for a moment. Without Psalm 103, that serves as a prelude, a, a, an opening to this section of Psalms, the next three Psalms make a very gloomy impression. But in this context, Psalm 103 is necessary. All God's generosity 
is displayed in creation and redemption. This is, a, this is the call of Abraham to the exodus out of Egypt. What did that lead to? How did Israel respond? And the Psalms take us there and talk about it. One act of rebellion after another. Sin upon sin. Idolatry. Intermarrying with the nations around them. And the list goes on and on. We learn in Psalm 106 that this particular psalm, Psalm 106, was written during the time of exile in Babylon. Look at what it says. Two verses out of Psalm 106. Just verses 40 and 41. The anger of the Lord has kindled against His people, and He abhorred His heritage. He gave them into the hand of the nations, so that those who hated them ruled over them. So that's, that's how we know it was written in exile. They were handed over to the nations around them. And when we consider all of this, we learn that the setting of Psalm 103 is set before the gloomy sequence of Psalm 104, 105, 106. Because Psalm 103 celebrates God's steadfast love, demonstrated in God's pardoning of the golden calf and David's adultery. So, if Moses and David experienced God's mercy all those years ago, then there may be hope for the exiled of Israel in another act of God's mercy. So that's what's going on with Psalm 103, 104, 105, 106. So let's look at the previous Psalms. So the Psalms, beginning with Psalm 102, working our way backwards. Well, book two of the Psalms ends with a very upbeat prayer. David's prayer for Solomon. We talked a little bit about that a few weeks ago. Psalm 72, beginning at verse 8. May he have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May the desert tribes bow down before him, and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and of the coastlands render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all the kings fall down before him, and all the nations serve him. This is David's prayer to God for Solomon. What an upbeat prayer. May May his kingdom be prosperous, David says. But you know, when we engage in Scripture and we learn about Solomon, Solomon did not live up to his father's hopes, did he? Eventually, the once great house, great house of David fell apart, leaving little of the kingdom, leaving the little kingdom of Judah to the mercy of the Babylonians. This seems to contradict God's promise to David. We talked about that too a couple of weeks ago. But here's how Book Three closes the, the last few verses of Psalm 83, or excuse me, 89. Psalm 89, beginning of verse 38. But now you have cast off and rejected. You are full of wrath against your anointed. You have renounced the covenant with your servant. You have defiled his crown with the dust. You have breached all his walls. You have laid his stronghold in ruins. Book 4 and the Psalms it contains, including Psalm 103, are an answer to this plea. They're an answer about God deserting his covenant with David and the promises he gave. In Psalm 90, God does not change, we are told a theme central to Psalm 103. The title of Psalm 90 is A Prayer of Moses, the Man of God. Several of the Psalms in Book 4 contain the phrase, The Lord reigns. Again found in Psalm 103 and verse 19, The Lord has established His throne in the heavens, and His kingdom rules over all. The Lord reigns. That's a theme in Psalm 103. Who's the author of this Psalm 103? Who sums up his experience and invites whole, the whole of creation to praise God? David. David. In book four, where this psalm is located, two of the psalms are David's. 
one, Psalm 90, is Moses. Well, you know what I find interesting? Go look for yourself. The rest of the Psalms in Book 4 are unknown. So now, having looked at what's going on before and after, we come to Psalm 103 itself. In this psalm, David praises God in his soul. From deep within, David says, or verse 1 of Psalm 103, All that is within me, David says, bless the Lord and forget not all his benefits. Verse 2, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. We are encouraged to reflect upon all that God has done. And David does that. Verse 3, who forgives all our iniquity, who heals all our diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. You know, I think you got I think we all may have sang this song if you grew up in the church at, at some point. Count your blessings. Name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. And that's what David is saying here. Consider all the things that God has done. And look at how how it will surprise you what He's done in your life. And then David takes us to Moses and reminds us of God's dealings with Israel, bringing hope of God's forgiveness. Verse 9, He will not always contend with us, nor will he, He keep His anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our guilty deeds. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His mercy towards those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far He has removed our wrongdoings from us. David is reaffirming his faith in God. The steadfast love of God is central to that thought. You know, what we're learning here, this wonderful psalm that David wrote about blessing the Lord with our soul. God keeps His promises to children's children. Psalm 103 is a song of hope to a downcast nation in exile. It is found in the context of exile in Babylon. And we may be tempted, as they were, to despair, but Psalm 103 shines as a bright light because it gives us a reason to hope. The offer included in the psalm for forgiveness is open to all. Even if we think we're the greatest of sinners, the forgiveness of God is for all. This promise is for those who fear Him. I leave you with the closing verses of Psalm 103, beginning in verse 17. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting for those who fear Him, and His justice to the children's children, to those who keep His covenant and remember His precepts so as to do them. The Lord has established His throne in the heavens, and His sovereignty rules over all. Bless the Lord, you His angels, mighty in strength who perform His word. Obey the voice of His word. Bless the Lord, all you His angels, who serve Him, doing His will. Bless the Lord, all you works of His, in all places of His dominion. Bless the Lord, my soul. Let us pray. Bless you, Lord, from deep within inside us as we consider all the things you do for us. Father, thank you. Thank you for this psalm. As we consider the world we live in today, it shines as a great light to us, Lord, reminding us of the hope and the expectant joy of home in heaven with you. It reminds us of forgiveness, that you have forgiven us and removed our trespasses against you as far as the east is from the west. Thank you, our God and our Father. Thank you for these weeks in the Psalms. 
Father, what, what wonderful things we have learned. And may what we've learned together have an impact and influence in how we approach the Psalms in our daily lives. Thank you for the book of Psalms, for the prayers that we can pray and the songs that we can sing as we offer you glory and praise and thanksgiving. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I hope that this series has been a blessing to you. I hope you've enjoyed our time together in the Psalms. We begin a new series next week on unity, living in unity, and I encourage you to, to join me then. Have a blessed week, and I'll see you again.